Election after election, America votes in Democrats or Republicans. Clearly, each party has its different views and what they stand for. Democrats are known for their liberal views, while Republicans are known for their conservative views. If both parties are supposedly so different, why is it that no matter what the party, our country continues to suffer? Year after year, Americans witness the ever-growing government power, never-ending wars, increasing indebtedness, and more international entanglements. So who are these political parties and what are they doing to America? Today, we not only have liberals and conservatives, but those who can be labeled as neoconservatives or neocons. Neocons are liberals who defected from the Democratic Party and set up shop in the Republican Party. When looking at the Republican Party, many can separate the true conservative from a neocon by watching how they vote, particularly on topics like the Patriot Act, the Federal Reserve, welfare, immigration, foreign policy, and much more. Neoconservatives will be easier to recognize when you have a better understanding of who they are, what their motivation is, and some of the history behind this movement. Irving Kristol, the man who happily accepted the title of godfather of neoconservatism, wrote Neoconservatism, the Autobiography of an Idea. A New York City native, he stated in his book, we accepted the New Deal in principle and had little affection for the kind of isolationism that then permeated American conservatism. It was recognized that both parties had the potential to change. In 1966, Georgetown University professor Carol Quigley authored a 1,300-page book entitled Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. Quigley claimed that it was a foolish idea to want Republicans and Democrats to offer different ideas and policies. Instead, he wrote, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. Irving Kristol and other like-minded politicians agreed with Quigley. So by 1972, neoconservatism began to flourish. During that year, many Democrats became discouraged with decisions within their party, as well as their choice for George McGovern for president. With seeing the direction their party was moving, they felt that their only option was to move to the Republican Party. Crystal explained what happened. In 1972, the nomination of George McGovern, an isolationist and a candidate of the new left, signified that the Democratic Party was not hospitable to any degree of neoconservatism. Only a few of us drew the obvious conclusion that we would have to try and find a home in the Republican Party, which had always been an alien entity so far as we were concerned. But with every passing year, our numbers grew. They didn't change what they stood for when they moved into the Republican Party. They began to change the Republican Party. Individuals with the neocon perspective have often been said to be supporters of Leon Trotsky. A good example of this was Irving Kristol. He stated, I regard myself lucky to have been a young Trotskyite and I have not one single bitter memory. Neoconservatives not only utilize national emergencies, they support international treaties and organizations such as the United Nations. The European Union, NAFTA, even NATO, all to their benefit. International entanglements such as these create economic and political integration with other countries, all detrimental to American independence and liberty. Neoconservatism has lured many Republicans to support enormous financial bailouts that went to foreign as well as domestic banking interests. It has persuaded many in the GOP to back the long list of federal regulations that are making it impossible for American companies to compete. And the neoconservative persuasion has convinced many to seek seemingly endless wars. Neoconservatism, also known as Bush Republicanism, is dead and gone, God willing. And they have to know whether they concede it or not that Trump's triumph is a sweeping repudiation of Bush Republicanism by the same party that nominated them four times for the presidency. Not only was son and brother Jeb humiliated and chased out of the race early, but Trump won his nomination by denouncing as rotten to the core the primary fruits of signature Bush policies. 
neoconservative policies. 12 million aliens are here illegally, said Trump, because the Bushes failed to secure America's borders. America has run up $12 trillion in trade deficits and been displaced as the world's first manufacturing power by China, said Trump, because of the lousy trade deals backed by Bush Republicans. The greatest strategic blunder in U.S. history, said Trump, was the Bush 2 decision to invade Iraq to disarm it of non-existent weapons of mass destruction. The war Bush began, says Trump, produced 5,000 American dead, scores of thousands wounded, trillions of dollars wasted, and a Middle East sunk in civil sectarian war, chaos, and fanaticism. That is a savage indictment of the Bush legacy, and a Republican electorate in the largest turnout in primary history nodded amen to that, brother. No matter who wins in November, there is no going back for the GOP. Can anyone think the Republican Party can return to open borders or new free trade agreements like NAFTA? Can anyone believe another U.S. Army like the ones Bush and Bush II sent into Afghanistan and Iraq will be mounted up and marched to remake another Middle East country in America's image? Only thing works in socialism and communism is corporate fascism. And we're sitting here looking at it. You got Julian Assange saying she's a demon, wants to start World War III. You got Jill Stein saying she wants to start World War III. You've got the Russian president warning. You've got all the top defense experts, including conservatives and people who have studied the Cold War and war, coming out on C-SPAN and saying, what is this, the new McCarthyism? So I don't know how to get through to you, but she doesn't represent you. You think you're going to get power, get some more goodies? Black people voted for Obama in record numbers. What they got was double unemployment. You go, why? Because the globalists, once they got you, once a pimp's got you, they want to break you down. Wing extremism grows out of the policies of the Clintons, in particular NAFTA, which sent our jobs overseas, and Wall Street deregulation, which blew 9 million jobs. Uh, up into smoke. So that's what's creating this right-wing extremism. A vote for Hillary Clinton isn't going to fix it. And one last point, which is this, that it's now Hillary Clinton who wants to start an air war uh, with Russia over Syria by calling for a no-fly zone. We have 2,000 nuclear missiles on hair trigger alert, and Mikhail Gorbachev, the uh, former premier of the Soviet Union, is saying we are closer to a nuclear war than we have ever been. Under Hillary Clinton, we could slide into nuclear war very quickly from her declared policy in Syria. So I won't sleep well at night if Donald Trump is elected, but I sure won't sleep well at night if Hillary Clinton is elected. Fortunately, we have another choice other than these two candidates who are both promoting lethal policies. But on the issue of war and nuclear weapons and the potential for nuclear war, it's actually Hillary's policies, which are much scarier than Donald Trump, who does not want to go to war with Russia.